as a nation, we spend more money uh, on health care than, than anybody else in the world, and we by no means have the best outcomes. Uh, and that, that's true at every level, at every level of our society. But we're also seeing a dramatic increase in chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, diseases that you can't cure with medicine. So how are we going to adjust? to that. I mean, the nature of our challenges has changed, and in many ways, we're still somewhat trapped in our own model, right? And, and the research tells us, really, where we need to go. Some Iowans will die years earlier than others who live just a short distance away because of differences in social and environmental determinants, such as education, income, race, ethnicity, and where they live. These Iowans die from preventable health problems and their health is greatly influenced by these powerful social determinants. We must find ways to reverse the negative effects of these factors and enable more people to lead healthy lives and avoid getting sick in the first place. Social determinants of health are conditions under which people live and work that influence health and quality of life. They are societal risk conditions rather than individual risk factors that either increase or decrease the risk of disease such as type 2 diabetes. Another way to think about the social determinants of health is they are the conditions that are beyond the ability of an individual to impact on their own. We develop a series of activities that will help us to engage our staff you know, to address these changes and be more proactive about how we can serve better our community. The first one was to conduct a research of health data. We want to know, you know what is the numbers, how in the area of social determinants, how factors as uh, employment, housing, uh, poverty level, children's in poverty, even uh, use of food stamps, uh, uh, factors like that affect our community. We notice that some zip codes are really struggling in comparison with the rest. So we want to know what's happening there. We know where people live is one of the most important determinants of health. For example, here in Polk County, there are six zip code regions that rank among the top ten in a number of negative indicators. Unemployment, vacant housing, below poverty, children below poverty, food stamps, housing burden. In September 2015, Tyler Norris facilitated a staff retreat and planning session on social and environmental determinants of health. So our conversation has been about what creates health. What are the drivers of health, the determinants of health, the contributors to health, and what undercuts people's ability to be healthy or to manage their chronic conditions. And we started off with a, a, a beginning of perhaps only 10% of what creates health has to do with access to medical care services. Another 30% has to do with our biological inheritance or our genetics. But fully 60% of what creates health has to do with our lifestyle and behaviors in the context of our environment. So what we eat, how much we move, uh, our use of tobacco or our immoderate use of alcohol or other drugs, and how that's influenced by the socioeconomic uh, and environmental factors in the community that either support healthier lifestyles or or sort of challenge us having healthier lifestyles. Here in Polk County, how does access to healthy, affordable, fresh food, um, because people have the ability to actually physically get to a place or be able to afford that food, how is that impacting health or supporting somebody's ability to manage their diabetes or hypertension? The sense that their housing is adequate to not have the dust and the mold that might drive uh, asthma. Um, the way in which the neighborhood is safe enough, both has sidewalks and crossing and adequate lighting that uh, parents would feel comfortable with their kids being physically active, walking to school, et cetera, walking to work. How, eat, how much does the environment actually support physical activity so that we make sure we get our 30 minutes a day or 60 minutes a day for kids? And how much does the culture that we live in essentially support healthier lifestyles? In addition to that, we, uh conduct also a series of testimonials. We ask for community leaders, um, patients, to share you know, their experience with these factors, with social determinants. 
So as you will see in this video, some of these comments, you know, provide a good information, a good input about how, you know, this, you know, how these numbers translate in actually real life and real impact that these determinants have over the life of these people. There are many challenges that this population has in terms of access to health care. Um, and I think it starts at home. Um, how are they able to get to the clinic? Um, do they have, one, do they have transportation, but do they also have a support system that um, will help them find out where the clinic is, how to get there, how do you make an appointment? Do they have the educational background or the language resources to be able to call the clinic, to make the appointment, to know how the system works? It seems easy for us that are familiar with the system. But for many patients who don't have that knowledge or experience, the process of making an appointment to come see a doctor can be very intimidating. The average middle class American gets, has their insurance through work. They have a primary doctor with whom they probably have a long standing relationship. And health care is fairly straightforward. But for somebody who doesn't have insurance at work or who may not have a job and whose life may be very chaotic as a result of poverty or recent immigration, it's much more complicated. Um, I have eight children. I have six girls and two boys, um, anywhere from the ages of 14 all the way down to two months old. Um, I am Puerto Rican. It is not that hard to uh, get health care for ourselves. We are in a Title 19 program. Some medications are not covered. Um, some treatments are not covered. And if you're not covered, you're just pretty much out of luck because they won't do it unless you pay out of pocket. So it's kind of hard. Most of our families do have Medicaid, and that covers our health insurance. Uh, mo a lot of our families do have issues with transportation, getting to the doctor when they need to. Um, they miss a lot of appointments because they rely on other family members for transportation. Yo tengo dos trabajos y trabajo en el McDonald's aquí en la Flores, en la 31, y tengo otro en el, aquí en el Dantado, un, un restaurante. Lo que pasa es que necesito tener dos trabajos porque pues te tengo que pagar mi, mis pastillas, mi, o sea, mi, para venir aquí a pagar mi consulta porque pues ya ve que aquí pues... Patients who have lack of access to health care insurance we have to get more creative in how we meet their needs. I make my um, decisions based on what can my patient afford. One of the biggest things I see is they don't always know where to go. A lot of people don't have that relationship with an actual office where they have a pediatrician or they have a doctor for themselves. We have a population of people that have some chronic illness because of those circumstances and because of being in a lower in more of a poverty um, type situation in their lives. Because I work for Broadlands, I actually get really good health insurance. Before I started working for Broadlands, I could not afford health insurance. And I just hope that I never had to have a surgery or anything like that. I think a lot of our clients also don't necessarily know that they should go to the doctor for a regular checkup solely because they haven't had access to that before. They might just only go to the ER when they have a health need. Last time I priced health care or health insurance, it was almost, uh, well, actually a little greater than three quarters of one week's paycheck. My medical bills generally run me less than $300 a year. I do have a hernia, and it's something I should have taken care of, but. I'm going to live with it for now until I can either afford to do something about it or I turn 66 and a half, or I turn, turn into the Medicare age and I can get it under Medi go under Medicare with it. In February, it would be five years away before I qualify for Medicare. I, I have to watch it to a degree, what, how I'm doing things. If it does pop out, I can put it back in without 
ease rub quickly and easily. Folks that spend uh, more than 30% of their income uh, on housing are considered to be cost burdened. Uh, now what we know is the impact of that cost burden is that folks are uh, cutting back on other expenses that are important and one of the biggest ones, uh, frankly, is health. And so we know people are cutting back on numbers of doctor visits. Uh, we know people are cutting back on their medications, dropping uh, insurance coverage, cut back or at least change uh, their diet. Studies have shown that constant stress of not having stable, affordable housing is having an impact on folks' cognitive abilities. Something that we really believe that housing is health care because your physical health and your mental health, everything just kind of gets a little bit more in tune with each other when you know where you're sleeping at night, when you feel safe about where you're sleeping at night. To sleep in a, uh, a new bed and to feel like you have ownership in where you're living is such a huge part and then you want to take care of your, your physical self and your whole self and that's such an important piece of it. I have four children. I have a 10-year-old boy, a 7-year-old girl, a 4-year-old girl, and a 2-year-old girl. Right now I'm actually buying a house on contract. It's a four-bedroom house. It's cheaper to buy on contract than it is to rent in Des Moines right now. So. If I don't pay the rent, then everything I paid towards the house, they just take as rent instead of as payment. And at the end of five years, I have to be able to get a $20,000 mortgage or they take the house from me and everything I've paid is rent. My house payment's over half of my budget. Okay. There is not as much supply as there is demand right now. And for some people, the bigger problem is, is they go under that 30% um, of the area income mark. And then the housing for them is even more limited. Some people make $7.25 an hour. Um, and they're adults taking care of themselves and other people. I mean, there's, there's just no way in Polk County that you can live on 725. Um, and so they work multiple jobs. So you find that they're exhausted. They don't take good care of themselves because there's no time to take care of yourself. Um, if it comes down to you having to choose uh, medicine or food, you know, let their health and all of things, medications, go to the wayside because they had to take care of their basic human needs, being food, shelter, and clothing. We know that it really takes about 250 percent of poverty in this country, and in Iowa in particular, to be sustainable as a family, and most of our families are nowhere near two and a half, two, you know, 250 percent of poverty, even working multiple jobs. I'm a certified medical assistant. I make fifteen ninety an hour. And I'm struggling. I have a college degree. I mean, it's only an associate's, it's not a bachelor's, but I've, it's more than a high school diploma. I don't know how people working at McDonald's for $8 an hour can, I don't know how they're making it because with my family, there's no way I could do it. That's why I had to go to school. I make m more money, but I, they take out more in taxes. They, um, my health insurance, now I can afford it, and it's nice that I can, but now I'm struggling. I'm in the same place as I was before I went to school because, I mean, yeah, now I'm living in a house, but it's taking up more than half my income. A lot of them don't do it just on a single job. They do it on two jobs, three jobs, working, you know, sometimes up to 18 hours a day, and then home to sleep for a brief period in between. Um, we see both husbands and wives working, so um, we see both people working um, long hours um, and rotating their shifts so that they can stay home with any children. Of the folks that in the community 
uh, that make less than 30% of area median income, which is anywhere from you know, 10 to, to $14 an hour, um, a full 30% of those people do not have cars. And so to the extent that we can reduce uh, folks' reliance on cars, uh, the more uh, resources then uh, that household has to spend on their housing, to spend on their medical care, to spend on food. I bought a 2000 Dodge Grand Caravan on my tax return one year, a um, couple years ago. It currently broke down, so and it just broke down like yesterday. I think the alternator is going out of it. Um, with my house payment and everything taking up most of my check, it's going to be a couple weeks before I get fixed. It is hard to own a car if you don't have a lot of money. And because you can own a car, but if it breaks down or you don't have $30 for a tank of gas, you're going to have to get on a bus. But I think a lot of people walk and ride bikes in Des Moines, which is really positive. But again, a bike is something that costs. And there are days when it's pouring rain that I wouldn't want to ride my bike either. As, as a, the greater Des Moines area, we're going to have to be more cognizant of how do we help people get around. Many of our families struggle with transportation. They don't have a car and they have to uh, catch the bus and it takes them downtown. They have to wait an hour in order to get back here. And if it's winter time and they have a baby and children and they're waiting that long, um, it's us that's usually an, a, an issue. Uh, so they really rely on other family and friends to help them get them to their WIC appointments. I mean, there's a new fairway that they just built over here on Grand, a few miles, three, four miles maybe. I've walked a few times, you know, it's about an hour walk, like half hour there, half hour back. Not to mention I'm carrying groceries at the time, but I try not to overdo it, just enough to, you know, make it back. And then sometime I'll catch the cab down, usually like six bucks each way. Refugees just given the trauma that they've experienced in their home countries and, you know, the, the possibility that they have been witness to violent activities or um, witnessed, you know, family members being killed or, you know, been subject to that themselves. Um, being able to digest and uh, heal once they get to the United States is something that is not given a lot of attention currently in the you know way our programs are structured. So we're doing a lot of work to ensure that refugees are properly screened for mental and behavioral health concerns once they arrive in the United States and also that they have access to appropriate treatment, which is both culturally and linguistically appropriate. If you're living to survive, um, I don't know that it's a priority. I mean, you look at food, clothing, shelter. Nowhere in there do we talk about health, mental or physical health, or spiritual health of an individual. Mental health is a huge issue here in Polk County. I think we um, don't have enough services uh, out there for the folks. I would say at least 50% of the folks that we um, encounter on a daily basis have some sort of mental health uh, diagnosis. I think stress in general is affecting their well-being. I think the um, safety is definitely a part of that. Um, are my children safe? Am I safe when I, you know, can we go for a walk as a family after dark? Um, but that stress is compounded by, am I going to be able to find food to feed them? Am I going to make enough to, to have these things? Is there a place I can get help if I don't? You know, it's those things. God forbid somebody gets sick. What are we going to do? You know, that kind of stress is so wearing on people physically. I think that, um, I think we see more parents that start to feel physically worn down. Something's broke that, that we have a certain population of people that can't break the barrier to make a livable wage, that continue to live in poverty. It's a cycle of poverty. And so we're tracking trauma. Um, uh, as we've begun this project and this initiative, Project Iowa, there's been a lot of work done here in Iowa um, around ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experience Scale. Maybe that is one of the things that is a barrier to this population is unresolved trauma. Traumatic events, especially repeated traumatic events um, in early childhood and life, we definitely see um, mental health issues that people have to have addressed. 
a safe house includes um, a home that is safe from things like environmental pollutants, uh, things like lead, uh, things like mold. After we had been in the house for about a year, um, both of the two little girls were coming up with high lead levels. So I called and I filled out the paperwork and um, then they came and they tested my house and there was um, lead in all the windows, lead in most of the um, doors, uh, lead paint um, in the stairwell. And so they're um, going to come in and get rid of all the lead paint and repaint and put all new windows in for me. A lot of our families uh, have children that, and they're not comfortable with them going out to play because they're, they don't feel like it's a safe place to, uh, they don't want to be outside by themselves. Um, so a lot of, we see a lot of these children gaining too much weight and so we try to give them ideas of how to stay active in the house. We have been having issues with lead problems um, we weren't aware of the extremities of the lead we had in the home until um, my daughter, Helena, she's three, um, we took her to the doctor and then they do a lead test for every kid. Um, and when they did hers, it was really, really high. Um, so the health department became involved. We have a little park um, just right around the corner um, that we can go and access to go exercise. Um, I don't necessarily l like it a lot um, because of the people that hang out there, bad behaving kids. <laughs> In my neighborhood, there's no way that I would leave my block um, after dark. So what we've found is clients don't sometimes have heat Sometimes their air conditionings are out. They've tried to access um, help from their landlords and their landlords are refusing to repair these places and they don't have anywhere else to go to. Places are either dirty, some of them are infested, especially with rodents, um, bed bugs, uh, fleas. So, and these are things that are not being taken care of. But Des Moines has such a diverse population and it one of the barriers we've seen is our families don't know how to cook the foods that they receive from WIC. Uh, so the people in their community usually can usually help them with that. Healthy food is expensive. We do get WIC, which WIC gives us farmer's market checks, and that's really nice because um, we can go to the farmer's market and um, trade those for uh, vegetables. When you're looking at what food is available to our population, um, it, it, it really depends on where you are in the city, whether or not you're adjacent to a nice store. I think a limited budget is a very big factor. Diet's a main problem because I don't have a lot of cooking time. I don't do much for morning other than something at a convenience store for breakfast. My lunches are 90% of the time convenience store lunches. 90% of the time I got to eat while I'm driving down the street with my truck work. We're really collaborating as a, as a community with homeless service providers and with some outside of the box opportunities. Um, opportunities that we really think are important are to meet new landlords and to um, kind of open that housing market up to advocate for more affordable housing. It's seeing uh, housing uh, or the quality of housing as an upstream uh, um, determinant uh, to public health is, is becoming uh, more and more an accepted practice around the country. And we are in fact, uh, I would like to say, on the cutting edge of that uh, here in, in central Iowa uh, through what we call Healthy Homes East Bank. 
for any unit that was turned into some sort of other type of housing that's maybe more upscale, that for every unit you take out, you have to replace in some way for affordable housing. I think that there needs to not only be more of an emphasis placed on um, access to care, but access to quality care where people want to sit down and actually get to know the patients, get to know their struggles, and then understand the resources and um, things within the community that are available um, for these people and will rally people um, when they see where resources are lacking um, and where we need to do a better job. One accident, one medical catastrophe, one um, month without a job can happen to any of us. It, it is the people that we sit next to in meetings. It is the people that we see at the grocery store. It is our neighbors. And we have to build a stronger community for everyone. So if everyone is prospering and everyone feels purpose, I mean, everybody benefits. How do we work together uh, with other organizations in the community uh, whose mission is to improve the lives of our residents? And so whether that's public health, uh, whether that's public transportation, uh, whether that's uh, the hospitals, uh, whether or not it's the business community who is looking to make sure that we have an adequate workforce, uh, whether it's the school district that says, hey, we need to really do a better job educating our kids. Um, all of us need to work together. Everybody, everybody of, of us is part of a community. Nobody's an island, isolated island, that whatever happened to this person will happen to the next. So that's why we were very concerned about how these factors are affecting our you know, staff. And to know more about that is what that we, we conduct this exercise. It gives us the, the sense of you know, how they see, how they perceive their patients, how they perceive the social determinants are affecting their patients. Also their knowledge about that. We notice that they are very knowledgeable about that. They are very aware or how poverty, how housing, how employment, even, you know, we talk about, you know, minimum wage could affect this, the life of our patients. You know, every day we're trying to fulfill the needs of, you know, the health needs of the, of the people in this community. But also it's very important, and I think this applies to any institution, to know what is the needs of your staff and how you can help them to fulfill these needs, how you can help them to reflect about, reflect about, reflect about them, and to know more about this, them, you know, will help you to be a better institution, be a better group. And having conversation with your staff is also as important as having conversation with the, with the rest of the community. There are no separate uh, actions. I think they are very good. You combine both, and they will be very good results. In our case, we hope that this conversation will help us to grow as a health department, help this community to get a better place, to get to a healthier place, uh, to be a healthier health department. <laughs> because we know no more than 10% of what contributes to our health comes from the clinic system, comes from formal medical care, comes from going to see your doctor. 10% is connected to our own individual biology and genetics. 30% comes from the lifestyle and behavior choices we make. Uh, how much do we eat? Do we consume alcohol beverages? Do we use tobacco products? Uh, but half of what contributes to our health are how we build, how we design, the areas where we live, work, play. Tip O'Neill was famous for saying all politics is local. Well, all health is local. We can look to national trends and guidelines, but at the end of the day, what our work needs to look like here now is what we decide it needs to look like here and now. As a health department, we have, we have a leadership responsibility in trying to direct the conversation in this community around what it really takes to build a healthy community. The exciting thing is there's so much work going on in this community that that is contributing to the same vision. We still think about health is what health departments and doctors do, and economic development is what you know chambers of commerce and part and the Des Moines Partnership does, and you know sustainability around is what the Tomorrow Plan's done. Done. 
But when you combine what all of us are trying to do, it's around creating community in which people thrive. I think that's health. But you know, the time, it, what we call it, doesn't matter. So wellness is embedded in all 10 of the capitals, looking from our business capital to our human capital as far as that talent and attraction and retention piece. We really see that it's something that we need to be working on on a community-wide level and even related to our built environment, looking at things such as the walkability work that's going on through the capital core and our natural capital with the Urban Land Institute, uh, some of the land bank work that's being started in partnership with the Greater Des Moines Partnership, really looking at the idea that if you don't have a strong home, that creates a whole set of challenges for the future. Sidewalks throughout our region as well are a huge issue. So really seeing that as something that's percolating throughout the community. In fact, we had the opportunity to help facilitate the development of a regional community health needs assessment during 2015. And we had five work groups, one of which was the physical environment, the leaders from our local health departments, hospitals, and other entities that are involved with the health and well-being work are recognizing that this is something that we as those wellness providers really need to be addressing beforehand so we can really be preventative in our well-being care. Well, I think the Tomorrow Panel uh, looked at a lot of different aspects of how we can improve um, the overall health of the communities along with a lot of other factors in, in the built and natural environment and how we can make active transportation uh, part of uh, the planning process so that people are, are moving more and, and, and having a healthier attitude um, towards transportation. We've been working with a number of, of our, our member governments on, on walkability as well as um, complete streets um, policies. The complete streets look at the overall design of, of a street and how you incorporate not only the moving of vehicles but moving of people, uh, which is really what the, the transportation system is about. And so that includes vehicles, but also how people can uh, access things through walking, uh, biking, or public transit system. Again, getting to that active transportation system so people are uh, not always dependent on a vehicle uh, to get them to their destination, uh, that they can get to the, the places they need to go um, through either walking or biking. I think a lot of people don't move enough um, in general. And so having those options available where it's, it's easy and safe for them to, to bike and walk to their destinations will improve their overall general health. The MPO is working with a lot of different organizations um, from private companies like Wellmark and Blue Cross Blue Shield to Polk County Health uh, on, on these different activities and then Greater Des Moines Partnership, uh, Urban and Land Institute, all these organizations are working on these ideas and, and partnering together to figure out how we can best uh, implement these systems and, and make sure we impact people's health in a positive manner. Our community is not unique in the fact that poor health outcomes are not distributed randomly throughout the community. That sometimes it's related to race, sometimes it's related to age, sometimes it's related to income, sometimes it's related to where you live, but there are patterns in which we see poor health outcomes in certain parts of our community. Having that capacity then helps guide where, where we invest our time and resources in, in, in giving those parts of the community the tools to be healthier. And if we're building a healthy community, then the choice, then both of us and all of us have the choices and have the support to live out our lives as fully and as meaningfully as we choose. That's my definition right, of, of a healthy community. I mean, if, if to make it tangible, right? I mean, it's sort of, you know, people have meaningful, well-paid work. They live in safe, affordable housing. There is reliable, dependable transportation that gets them between their home and their job. And they have access to the resources and support to play as they so choose. Polk County Health Department is working with a number of other organizations to address social and environmental health determinants with the goal of creating a healthier community for all residents of Polk County.